Hi, everyone. Welcome to Day Had Fun. I'm Rachel, and I am back with another amazing story about New York City. And I am fresh off the heels of my wonderful birthday party this Saturday. We had a great time, but I'll just be honest with you guys. Not a single one of you showed up. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, it's the truth. I was trying to decide, like, do I be honest about this and say, like, no one showed up? Or do I, like, try and play it off like we had this big group? I mean, to be fair, a bunch of my friends showed up. So, like I said, I do have friends. So, it was still a wonderful time. Uh, it was still one of my favorite days. We went to a bunch of different spots. I had a blast with all of my friends. But I think maybe to expect a few people to show up, we might need, I don't know, 10,000 more followers or something like that. That's okay. It was still an absolutely wonderful time. And I had some delicious cake. I had some drinks out at some bars with a bunch of different people. And then, you know, true birthday fashion in New York City. I don't entirely remember coming home and that's just wonderful. Okay, let's get on to our Rachel's Rex for today. I'm very excited for both of these, but I'm a little bit more excited for one of them. That'll be our second one. So let's get going with our first one. And that was your request. I like to see this too, to be honest, for a coffee shop in Ridgewood. Now you guys know I ride hard for Ridgewood. You're always saying you want to come out here. I'm going to start giving you more options. We all know, don't we, that it was ranked fourth coolest neighborhood by Time Out New York. Let's not forget that. Uh, entirely untrue. But if you do want to come to a coffee shop in Ridgewood, there are many. But if I have to pick just one, I am going to give you one of the newer ones that I really think you will enjoy. And that is Honeymoon Coffee Shop on Onderdonk Avenue. Now, what's really going on at this place is you got the cool factor, all right? This is where all of the cool kids go. They do that specialty sourced coffee beans that they roast themselves. I don't have all the details on that, but they do have a book annex in the back with Molasses Books, another shop in Bushwick. They opened an annex here. They also have a bunch of really, really cool records. They have great music. They have booze at night. It is just the all around perfect place. I go there to work sometimes, but you can do all sorts of things. You can go pick up a gift. You can have some coffee with friends. You can sit outside. It is definitely become a hot spot in Ridgewood and it is very very fun so go check out Honeymoon in Ridgewood on Derdonk Avenue let's get into my second recommendation and I'm very excited about this one because it comes into play with the whole theme of our episode today and leading into this week and next week in New York City it is the U.S. Open so I am recommending if you have never been now is your opportunity and there are two great options for you to do it so the U.S. Open officially starts next week August 28th lovely you can get expensive tickets. You can go as luxe as you want. You can get just entry day passes. And if none of that works for you, you can also go this week. So starting yesterday is their preliminary and qualifying rounds. And this is free to New Yorkers. You heard that right. So when New Yorkers think nothing is for free, wrong. When people think tennis isn't for me, it is for the rich elite, wrong. You can go to Queens and watch these truly sensational athletes play and battle to get in. You're going to hear more about this in my interview. I just wanted to give you part of this as my Rachel's rec. So go check it out sometime this week. Go next week and buy last minute tickets. I have been like every year since the first time I went. I just think it is truly such a fun time. It is summer in New York. It is so great. It is beautiful inside that stadium. I just absolutely love it. And I cannot recommend it enough. Make sure you go check out the U.S. Open. This is your year. This is your time to go. If you are hearing this and you have never been, go buy those tickets. You know who I'm talking to, one person in particular. We talk about it every year. Okay, because of that, let's get into my guest for this week. It is such a great time to have him on. And I'm so excited to talk to him. He is what I would consider to be the tennis man. He also happens to be, we might call him a reluctant writer, a filmmaker, but most of all, he is the host of the wonderful Craig Shapiro tennis podcast. Please welcome to the show, Craig Shapiro. Thank you very much for having me, Rachel. Rachel, you know, when we met, you got a full taste of our tennis craziness and um, how timely that we're uh, here now. And shortly, the U.S. Open's about to begin and where New York becomes really the center of the world. So very nice to be here. I'm glad you brought that up because that is exactly everything I want to talk about. I'd love to talk about when we met, as you referenced, I'd love to talk about the Open, as I think people sometimes miss out on it, and we really want to talk about it. And you are the person to talk about it. But yes, I did see you in your element at one of your events that, to be quite honest, I had no idea was your event. I was just a regular patron off the street. And when I walked in, 
every single person in the bar said to me, oh, how do you know Craig? Oh, you have to talk to Craig. You must know Craig. Craig's the best guy. And just on and on and on. So finally, I found my way to you. We got to chatting. You are the tennis man. You do everything surrounding tennis. You have a illustrious background and career in tennis. And I think people often forget that tennis is a huge part of the New York City scene, whether they know it or not. You are the perfect person to have on the show how did this podcast start? How did you get into tennis? Give everyone the background. So my mother is from Jackson Heights, Queens. My father is from Connecticut. Oh, wow. Okay. But my dad loved tennis. My dad, he taught himself to play and he saw like what it was going to be. There was Connors and Arthur Ashe and Bjorn Borg. And for like 30 years, my dad ran a trip from Rhode Island to the U.S. Open the middle weekend. So Labor Day weekend. I'm 51 years old. I think I've been to like 40 U.S. Opens, something crazy. Oh, my God. But my dad loved tennis. I grew up in tennis. I was just an OK player. I played high school tennis. I didn't play college tennis. But when I finished college, guys I went to college with had a spot on 16th Street between 5th and 6th, right across from Xavier High School. One of the guys got a job at ESPN. He moved out. I moved in. I got a job teaching tennis at the now defunct New York Health and Racquet Club on the corner of Wall Street and South Street. You know, after a year or two of that, I tried to like work on Wall Street. Like all these Wall Streeters would take tennis lessons and come there. So I took those tests and I was like, I hated it, but I answered an ad that came across the fax machine. <laughs> you know, like when you go buy a tennis racket on, on the shelf, if you took 10 of the same rackets, they're all different. The way the balance is, the dimensions of the grip. So the pros can't have that. So there was this guy, his name was Jay Schweid. He looked like Howard Stern. He had like this crazy long, like greasy curly hair and he smoked Marlboro Reds. And he loved tennis and he figured out how to make the rackets all the same. He had this business for the pro players where he would customize the rackets. The name of the business was Jay's Custom Stringing. It was on 51st Street between 2nd and 3rd. Andre Agassi is a crazy story. So it was like 1997 and, you know, and, and Andre Agassi had had a problem with his rackets and Jay fixed the problem and they got a deal done where somebody from... Jay's custom stringing would travel with Andre everywhere he went and they needed someone to travel with Andre. And, and, and for about a year and a half, two years, I traveled with Andre Agassi and the rest is kind of history. I never really found a great lane in tennis for myself. I kind of dipped in and out of the sport. Okay. First of all, I don't know how you're saying you haven't found your lane in tennis, maybe up until a certain point, but you certainly did. You worked for some of the greats of all time. And now you have this incredible podcast where you literally know everyone. That aside, I have so many thoughts. One, like, first of all, being that this career has <laughs> a fax coming to your office like your entire existence right now of everything in tennis well yes you had the background and you knew a lot and obviously your worth is what played into that but just a fact showed up one day and you got this job working for Andre Agassi I think it also all entirely does this because I have to say this it plays into New York City and the opportunities that just come here oh no 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 the city the city has been a profound character in my life. I love to hear that. Let's just do like a quick little bit. We don't have to go into depth, but a little bit telling everyone why they should go to the U.S. Open. You know, I was telling you, I never went. My family never liked tennis. I didn't have the background that you did. And we just bought tickets on a whim to do something New York centric. And we went to the U.S. Open and had a fucking great time. I was like, why has no one ever told me about tennis? What's your quick pitch as to why everyone, whether a tennis fan or not, should go check out one of the greatest sporting events in New York City, the US Open that comes very soon? The vibe is just, I can't get over what a good time it is. It's like Disneyland for adults in a way. Yes. You can buy a day pass and watch these battles go on. You can sit out in the public areas and you can do whatever you want. You can have drinks. You can eat a lobster roll. You can eat a <laughs> a crepe. It is a bonanza of good times. It's international in a way that no other sport really has something like this, where these young athletes, many of whom are the most famous people in their countries. Yeah. If a Ecuadorian player is playing, they'll be, you know, the Ecuadorians will come out for them. If there's an Israeli player, they Israelis come out for them. The 
And I will say, I will tell you the the week before the open begins. So the open begins on August 28th, but the week before the 22nd to the 28th, uh, they open it up for free. You can walk through those gates for free and there's an entire tournament Incredible. to get into the tournament. So the draw, the top 128 players in the world can play, but then there's another bunch of spots that they give to what they call the qualifiers. The qualifiers have to win three matches over the course of the 22nd to the 28th. It's amazing. It is really good. They put on a great show to go out there for free is a lot of fun too. And I, I highly recommend it. You know, what a little nugget there. Like this really is people sometimes think of tennis as an elite sport, but here in New York City, of course we do. We make it for the people. There are the opportunities for regular New Yorkers to just go and see some exciting, thrilling tennis. And, you know, the part to me that I find most enjoyable and that you referenced and I think is really interesting is really the tournament itself is ultimately a parallel of New York City, where you're saying all of these different countries, nations, people come together, and only in New York City, is there someone from that country and an entire group rooting for those people, you know, and you really see in New York City, we have everyone here, and they are out representing and rooting for their countries. And it truly just is such a fun experience. I really hope people hear this and are like, I'm going to check it out this year. It is such a good time. Okay. After we've got through all that tennis stuff, let's get to some of our questions of the show. Let's get to know you a bit more and more about your New York City background. So let's start off with the first question, which is always, when did you move to New York? March or April, 1995. Like I literally drove a U-Haul from Narragansett, Rhode Island. i drove it to 16th street. And I never I never left. And I just love when people have the stories of remembering the drive down of that U-Haul arriving to 16th Street. We had a triplex. Oh, my God. Each of us had our own floor. The rent was I never forget. It was eighteen hundred bucks. We all paid six hundred. And then Rudy Giuliani became mayor. He did something and the rent like went up to where we couldn't afford it and we all had to move. Oh, thanks, Rudy. Went up from like 1800 to like 6600 or something like <gasps> overnight. Something crazy. Oh my god, See, I, I love that you know these details. This is the kind of stuff that gets me so excited knowing like okay, so we always know the second question, why did you move to New York? And we know a bit like your family was from here. After you finished college, why did you decide to move to New York City? I needed New York more than I realized. Put it that way. I was like this like college goofball from Rhode Island. And then I was then all of a sudden you're in the city and you got to, you know, you start meeting different people. And I definitely needed it. And I had a girlfriend, actually, from the day I moved here. I'd met a girl. I'd come to visit friends. I'd, I'd had a girlfriend. You know, I think that probably impacted the decision, too. Uh, she was in New York. Yep. Yeah, that'll impact the decision a little bit, too. Mm. No, I mean, it's great. I, I love hearing a little bit of like the true sort of like romance and like not not about the girl, but I'm sure there was. But the romance you feel towards the city and like the true yeah, love no. and like you being able to acknowledge like it shaped me. It changed me. I needed it. Like all of these things that I think a lot of people feel when they come to New York City and hope that they can find and have happen. And for you, it did. It's a success story. Yeah, not without its um, <laughs> ups and downs, but, you know, sure, thank sure, you, Rachel. Sure. Many ups and downs. OK, considering all of these things of you, you just came here, sort of, why not? And maybe for a girl that you've been here forever, that it does mean so much to you that there have been ups and downs. Maybe some of the ups might lead us into our next question here. I have to ask you the most important question of the show. And that is, of course, Craig, what is the most fun you've ever had in New York City? So I had a friend who had gotten friendly with Ryan Gosling and I had got friendly with Ryan Gosling. I was, I was 32. He's like eight or nine years younger than me. So he was like 24 at that time. I had been spoke. It had been said that he was like going to be like the next Sean Penn. Oh and my God. He's a great guy. And, and he had a place in downtown LA. He had actually bought into this restaurant that he still has, I believe, on Robertson Street. It's a it's a it's a Moroccan spot called Tajine. And I was booking work out there. So I was popping out there. I'd come in to like go shoot something for VH1 and he would make sure we were all we were all hooked up at the restaurant. And oh my God. We had a few good times. But so when we first met. I don't know, like, like if you know anything about him, he he was a child actor. Yeah, he came up. He was a Mouseketeer. My friend and I, we don't have that background, and I didn't really know any actors at that time. And I, <laughs> this is this is pretty funny. So, <laughs> it was a big night for me. I interviewed Kate Winslet 
and Alicia Keys during the Glamour Magazine Women of the Year Award show at the Museum of Natural History. Oh, my God. So I was like 32. And somehow the guys who were producing this show thought that I... I don't know that I that I did good interviews or that I was not yeah. terrified of celebrity, whatever it was. So I had, I put on a suit <laughs> anyway. So I did the interviews and the after party for this whole thing was in the room with the dinosaurs. Yes. And Ryan and my buddy Brendan showed up and Fomka Jansen was there. And Ryan started talking to Fomka Jansen, Fomka Jansen, Dutch supermodel who is a big actress. Right. But Ryan was like talking to Fomka Jansen at this thing and talking and talking and talking. We leave and we went to Butter on Lafayette Street. Oh, my God. And we can't we, And the paparazzi was, you know, popping pictures and we go in. Your Olsen twins were there. <laughs> uh, and there is no dance floor there. You know, Fomka comes. And at some point, Ryan is spinning Fomka Jansen around like the non-existent dance floor, like he's Fred Astaire. It was amusing, I guess. And she looked like she was having the greatest time of her life and pa 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 <laughs> and the whole thing was happening. We leave and we go to Bungalow 8. It's probably like two o'clock in the morning. The hot spots. I like, this is so good. And, but on our way to Bungalow 8, my friend and I start giving him a little bit of a hard time, like the way you would with friends. So we were like, yo, man, what was with what was with that Fred Astaire act? Yeah. And he froze. We said, like, hey, man, what was with all that dancing? He's like, what? And he froze. He seized up. Go to Bungalow E. Fomka slides in. I'm sitting down with my back turned and I'm eating a grilled cheese. And Amy Sacco is like doing her thing. And I get a tap, tap, tap on my back. Mm. And I turn around and it's Fomka. And she's like, hey, so you don't like my dancing? Oh, no. And I looked at Ryan and I was horrified. And I was like, no. I was like, I was like, I was just joking around with my friend. Yeah. And she's like, well, because if you don't like my dancing, you must not like, if you don't like his dancing, you must not like my dance. Anyway, it ruined our friendship. <gasps> Never, ever, nobody ever came back from that. I don't ever, I don't think we ever spoke, never ran into him ever again. No way. Wait, but listen, there's a lot of lessons in this. This is good. So years and years later, I always made it a point to go see all the movies that are in competition. So I went by myself one afternoon to see La La Land. Yes, I knew. I knew. And I don't, and I don't know anything about the movie. And I lately, I leave the movie and I call my friend. Brendan, the one who we had screwed up this friendship together with Ryan. I said, hey, man, I said, do you remember the night that he's like, yeah, how could I forget that night? We'd screw, we I was like, do you know what happened? Right. He's like, what? I said, man, we made fun of his number one thing. Like Ryan was always made to become Fred Astaire. Mm hmm. It would be like if somebody made fun of my tennis. Like I've been playing tennis since I was a little kid. If you were like, oh, man, you got to see this guy play tennis. It's, it's a joke. Yeah. <laughs> it would freeze me up. Like I'd be crushed forever. Yeah. So we crushed him. And that, my friends, is the story. Ryan Gosling's a great guy. And he didn't want to hear us making fun of his dancing. <laughs> I have to say, I love how uh, your most fun you've ever had in New York, which is really, truly quite fun, has somehow become a PSA for how great of a human being Ryan Gosling is. And no one... <laughs> Take it any other way. And we made fun of him for dancing, man. We made fun of his best thing. You, Fred, like he really is a modern day Fred Astaire. We that that happened. But you know, <laughs> it was sort of like a who's who of that early 2000s nightlife that I thought maybe your listeners would kind of think was sort of interesting. I do love it. And I think it's kind of like if we're gonna find a way to sort of circle it all back, I really think it does. Like you saying you coming here as a kid and New York shaping you, and there was lessons to be learned, and you had to change a little bit. And yes, you might have ruined a close friendship with one of the greatest movie stars of all time. But however you learned something from that, it probably made you grow as a person, as a New Yorker. But mostly you had a shit ton of fun at all the hot spots throughout New York City in the mid 90s. I mean, you just saying some of these places I have never been, but I know them like butter, like Bungalow 8. I was like a teenager hearing Bungalow 8 on Sex in the City and being like, oh, I wish I could go there. And you went to all of them like in one night and with superstars. Yeah. And I always bring it back to this idea of you being this kid driving down Broadway in your U-Haul. No doubt. Fast forward 10 years later, you are partying at the biggest and best places with the biggest stars. You know, you, you learned a little something, but mostly it is very, very fun. Oh, no doubt. Listen, I, 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 um, 
you know, the best place to be in my 20s. It was the best place to be in my 30s. Yes. No, listen, I did very special things in New York City. Yes. Very, very true. And I love like I just hope kids hearing this who think what what's there for me? You know, what can I do? Like your 20s and your 30s, like you said, can be shaped in New York City and you can become a different person. And maybe they'll be partying with celebrities. Uh, I love that story. It is quite literally so much fun and a learning lesson. I now have to ask you our last question of the show. And that is, what is your favorite thing about New York? I think that you can make big shit happen in New York. If you put in the effort and you put yourself out there in a meaningful way, that's why I'm always so like, not displeased, but I'm like always like a little disappointed. Yeah. Maybe I am like a little disappointed when, you know, I see all these people doing finance or doing real estate or like, we don't need any more of that. We need more of the people in the nooks and the crannies doing stuff. But I see it though. Now, now I'm downtown. I was just, I was just, you know, people were like, Oh, New York's going to be over and it's never over. No, no, it's never, ever over. Everyone's doing cool stuff. It's just the most unique place. And maybe it is the energy. Maybe it's the energy. Maybe it's the people, but you have to figure it out for your edit. I'm not going to do that for you. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's good. I think everything you're saying, if you want to, you can do it. It's going to be a lot of hard work. It's going to be a lot of determination and grit, but you can do it. And New York will never be over. And even in times where it might feel like it is, it's still not. And there are always some cool kids in some corner doing some cool art shit that we're always going to appreciate. And maybe stuff that I think is cool other than stone or whatever, you know, you can, you can be whoever you want, but I'd like to see less finance and more... (laughs) graffiti artists. I'm so happy that you came on to talk tennis with me to tell me your fun story. We're very sorry, Ryan Gosling. He's definitely hearing this right now. Craig, thank you so much for being on the show, for telling that very fun story and for inspiring everyone to go watch some tennis in New York City. Thank you. My pleasure. Most of all, thanks, New York. They had fun.